Welcome again. Right now we're at Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 35. Gentiles enter Torah. Now, I've been looking forward to do this for quite some time now. This is very, very exciting. This is a milestone in what some would call New Testament doctrine. The problem is most Christians, by far most Christians, have no clue what this really means. They read it from a very, very shallow perspective, very, very shallow theologically, because Acts chapter 15 contains some very rich Jewish doctrine here. And unless you read it from a Jewish mind, you will not be able to understand it whatsoever. In order to get the most out of scripture, we got to read it in context. And reading it in context means a lot more than just reading a few verses before and a few verses after a particular passage. It means a lot more than just reading a chapter before and a chapter after. It means a lot more than just reading the whole book. It means getting into the culture. The culture of the author can dictate the definition of what is spoken here. And this is what we're going to talk about in this particular teaching. So fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be awesome. Some men came down from Judea and taught the brothers, unless you are circumcised after the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small discord and discussion with them, they appointed Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. First little piece of spiritual gold here. Notice, Paul and Barnabas had to go back to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles about this. They had to go back to the apostles because they were under the apostles. Very key to understand this here. So the implication here is that Paul and Barnabas is like, well, you know what? Maybe we're wrong. We need to go back to the apostles to see what they say about this. We are under the apostles. We have to answer to the apostles because perhaps we might be missing it here. Now, notice that today a lot of Christians hold the teachings of Paul at par with the teachings of the apostles, such as James and Peter and such. There is nothing wrong with Paul and Barnabas saying, you know what, we got to go talk to the apostles about this because we need to have confirmation about what we believe here. We need to come under their authority. We need to just kind of bounce it off of them to see what they think. Okay, there's nothing wrong with Paul and Barnabas doing that. Likewise, there's nothing wrong with a Christian today who reads the letters of Paul to bounce it off the letters of James or Peter or John. Okay, nothing wrong with that. In fact, Paul was under Peter, James, and John. We know that because Paul was never numbered amongst the 12 apostles. We made that very clear in Acts chapter 1. And also, we know that because just the way that Paul and Barnabas behaved here. They're like, okay, we disagree with you guys. You guys are saying that we, you need to be circumcised, you know, and follow the law of Moses in order to be saved. You know, emphasis on circumcision. We disagree with that. Now, just in case, I mean, we maybe we're wrong. Just in case, we need to go back and talk to the apostles about this, okay? We need to go back to our authority. We need to bounce it off of them. So that is what Paul and Barnabas did here. Let the reality of that sink in for a minute. I know it's very hard for some ultra-conservative evangelical Christians to accept that fact, but that is a fact. Verse 3, they, that's Paul and Barnabas, being sent on their way by the assembly, the, the believers, passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. They wasted no time here. It's like, on the way to the apostles, we're going to preach. We're going to preach to the Gentiles. We're going to preach that the Gentiles, even the Gentiles can get saved. Can you believe that? They caused great joy to all the brothers. When they had come to Jerusalem... They were received by the assembly, by the believers, by the church, and the apostles, and the elders. And they reported everything that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Notice here, they, as in the church... The apostles 
and the elders, there were some of them that were Pharisees, okay? Obviously in context here, the apostles had nothing to say against being a Pharisee. I mean, they could have preached, you know, the first 14 chapters of Acts, they could have preached, you know, you got to repent of your Phariseeism. You got to repent from being a Pharisee and you've got to be converted to be a Christian. That's not how they preached. That's not how it was. They were Pharisees and they were believers in Yeshua HaMashiach at the same time, okay? They were Pharisees and they were saved and they went by the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, okay? That is another fact. Consider that even Paul himself in the book of Philippians said that he is a Pharisee. He didn't say, I was a Pharisee in the book of Philippians. Paul said, I am a Pharisee, okay? He did not renounce his Phariseeism. He did not come out from being a Pharisee and become converted to Jesus. That's not what happened. He maintained his Pharisee status to the end. So you got to understand, this is not like it was in the days of Jesus when he was preaching and these Pharisees were staunchly opposed to him. No, just because you're a Pharisee doesn't mean that you're a bad person, doesn't mean that you believe something that's wrong, not at all. Again, consider that two-thirds of the so-called New Testament was written by a Pharisee. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to see about this matter. When there had been much discussion, Peter rose up and said to them, just like how Peter always does. He seems like he's always the first one to speak up in every situation. So Peter speaks up and says, Brothers, you know that a good while ago, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the nation should hear the word of the good news and believe. It almost brings a smirk on my face thinking about how Peter said, it's by my mouth the Gentiles hear the gospel. Like, you know, like, you know, seeing that Paul was considered to be the apostle to the Gentiles and Peter stands up and says, you know, it's by my mouth the nations heard the gospel. Verse 8, God who knows the heart and testifies about them, giving them the Holy Spirit just like he did to us, he made no distinction between us and them cleansing their hearts by faith, okay? This is making the unclean clean. This is Peter's vision, okay? Making the unclean clean. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God? Ouch, that is an accusation. You tempt God. That you should put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Now, what did Peter mean here when he said, you put a yoke, you put a burden on the disciples, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. The fathers being the patriarchs, the Jewish patriarchs, okay? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and on and on it goes. You know, seeing that the first thing they said was that they should be circumcised and follow the law of Moses, there is an emphasis on circumcision because you know circumcision is in the law of Moses, but they had to repeat that by saying these men should be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. So what Peter is saying here is you are requiring that all these men, including the elderly men, to be circumcised and to put on unnecessary, unreasonable restrictions and regulations on them. None of the Jewish fathers, none of the patriarchy was able to do this. We're not able to do this. Why are you making it mandatory for other people to do this in order to get saved? Peter continues, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. Do understand this fact that Peter is not introducing anything new here. Peter is drawing a picture for everybody, saying, consider all of the fathers, all of our fathers, all of the Jewish patriarchs, okay? And then he says, we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, okay? So in context again, he is saying that all of the patriarchs, including himself, is saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. And this is very evident. I mean, Jesus himself said to those who were searching the scriptures of Moses, searching the Torah, he said, you're reading that, but you don't understand that is all about me. I'm the human form of what you're reading. You're reading the written form, I'm the human form. How did Moses write all that stuff down? Because he knew Jesus, obviously. 
It was by the grace of the Lord Jesus that Moses was saved. God doesn't change, neither does his law change, because he doesn't change. Verse 12, all the multitude kept silence, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul, reporting what signs and wonders God had done among the nations through them. After they were silent, James answered. Very important. We go from Peter speaking up to James speaking up. Remember, these are the men that Paul looked up to. These are the men that Paul had to answer to. These are the men that Paul had to bounce the doctrine off of to make sure that it was correct. So James says, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has reported how God first visited the nations to take out of them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written, after these things I will return. I will again build the tabernacle of David which has fallen. I will again build its ruins. I will set it up that the rest of men may seek after the Lord. All the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. And this is Amos chapter 9 verses 11 and 12. So look at James here. He says, okay, we're on track here because this is in line with the Tanakh. This is in line with the prophets, the Nevi'im. This is in line with what Amos said. Notice what's happening here. Paul and Barnabas goes to the apostles to balance the doctrine off to say, are we right? Are we okay? You know, what do you think about this? The apostles go back to the so-called Old Testament to prove the doctrine. Verse 18, all of God's works are known to him from eternity. Therefore, my judgment is that we don't trouble those from among the Gentiles who turn to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, from sexual immorality, from what is strangled, and from blood. For Moses, from generations of old, has in every city those who preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. A lot of Christians just read this and it just goes way over their head, okay? First of all, notice that James did not preach the modern day corrupt Christian message that we hear today. In other words, he didn't say, oh no, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to go by the Torah. Just come forward, say the sinner's prayer. Just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you are covered with the righteousness of Christ and God doesn't see your sin no more. That's not what he said. Not what he said. Neither did he fully agree with the extreme view of all these old men need to be circumcised and follow strictly all of the law of Moses. Neither did he go by that either. But he laid down four laws for the Gentiles in order to be saved. Notice in context, this is the whole issue here. What must men do to be saved? Let's not lose perspective here. The whole context of what's being talked about is what men must do to be saved. It started by people saying, no, all these men, right up to the old man in the bed, they need to be circumcised and they need to follow all the law of Moses. It started from that. James brought it down to four laws. Number one, abstain from the pollution of idols. Number two, from sexual immorality. Number three, from what is strangled and from blood. Now, where did James come up with these laws? Did he just kind of pull them out of a hat? Did he just kind of, you know, make a draw? Okay, let's put all of the law of Moses in this one little container. And we'll just draw what, what laws need to be done in order for people to be saved. Oh, we got the first one. No, you know, don't have any idols before, before God. Another one, you know, no sexual immorality. Another one, don't eat blood. You know, so where did they get this stuff from? It's common knowledge among the Jewish people that there is what they would call today the Noahide laws, okay? The Noahide laws are the laws that Gentiles are required to obey in the mind of a Jew. If you are just an outright heathen and you want to be converted to Judaism today, you go talk to your rabbi and most likely you're going to hear, well, okay, in order to be converted to Judaism, first of all, seeing that you are a Gentile, you need to start with the Noahide laws. And this is the deal, okay? Now today, nearly 2,000 years later, in Judaism, they boiled it down to a lot more. They, they refined it a lot more than the way it is here in Acts chapter 15. So now they've got it down to a magical seven 
Noahide laws that the Gentiles must obey in order to be introduced into Judaism. Let's go over this very quickly. Now, this is not in any particular order, but first of all, we're not to worship idols. And obviously, if you don't worship idols, that means you worship only God, which leads to the second command, not to curse God. The third Noahide law is to establish courts of justice. Now, this goes without saying, this is justice in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of just any kind of Joe Blow walking down the street. What's just to one person might not be just to another person. So yes, again, this is directly connected to the command not to worship idols because if you only worship God, you will do what's just in his sight and justice will be based upon justice in God's sight. Otherwise, if you have yourself as an idol or something else as an idol, you're going to build a justice system around those particular values as opposed to God's values. Number four, do not murder. Number five, do not steal. Again, these are also offshoot commands from the command not to worship idols. If you worship only God, then you value only God. There's no reason to idolize something so much that you steal it. There's no reason to idolize your own opinions or your own feelings or anything else to murder. No, you worship only God and you respect others. So it all boils down to that command against idol worship. Number six, do not engage in sexual immorality. And by definition, according to the scriptures, that includes incest, adultery, and homosexuality. Number seven, not to eat flesh with blood still in it. So as you see, these commands that we have today in Judaism, the Noahide laws, is just basically, in, in its basic state, exactly what James said in Acts chapter 15. This is exactly what the Jews do today. When you got a Gentile that wants to be converted into Judaism, like what do we do with the Gentiles? Well, first things first, require them to obey the Noahide laws. Require them to be submissive to the Noahide laws, which is in essence, exactly what James said in Acts chapter 15. So where did he get these from? Where did he get these commands from? He didn't pull them out of a hat. He didn't make it up just to put some kind of laws upon the Gentiles that want to be saved. No, he did it because this was common knowledge back in those days. In order to be converted to the Jewish faith, you must abstain from idols, abstain from sexual immorality, abstain from things that are strangled. In other words, with the blood still in the meat, abstain from blood. Okay, this is in essence the Noahide laws. See, the last thing that James said, he made it very clear. He summarized it. He brought it all down. He made a conclusion of it. He said exactly why they decided to hold the Gentiles to these four laws to begin their walk of salvation. In verse 21, let's read it again. This is the reason behind their decision. For Moses from generations of old has in every city those who preach him in other words those who preach torah being read in the synagogues every sabbath so this is where it all, this is where it's all wrapped up in right here james could have said oh we don't go by moses anymore we don't go by the torah no more we got jesus alone now i mean jesus did away with that god forbid God forbid. If that's what happened, God is a liar because he said very clearly, these commands, this word is forever, ever, perpetual, throughout all generations. Now, once again, in order to understand this properly, you have to read this from a Jewish mind, okay? You cannot read a Jewish text written by a Jewish man from a Jewish culture, from a, with a Gentile mind. It's just not going to add up properly. You're not going to interpret it properly. In the Jewish mind, the laws that James brought down here for the Gentiles in order for them to be saved is only the beginning. It is only baby steps in God. It's only baby steps in Torah. So the idea is this, okay? These Gentiles... They did not grow up in a Jewish culture, in a Jewish country. They were not raised with Jewish values. They were not raised with Jewish knowledge. They were not raised with Torah. Torah involves a lot. There is a lot that's wrapped up in Torah. It could take decades or more just to study Torah. In fact, you know what? Today, there are people even very 
elderly people who have been studying Torah all their life and they're still learning from Torah. So the idea is, hey, you cannot just expect somebody who has no knowledge of Torah just to come in and say, we want you to obey and know all of it right now, at this very second or else you won't be saved. No, you got to have baby steps to start out with. You got to know, okay, you got to have something just to get in the door, okay? So the idea is, yes, these laws that James brought down, this is just the beginning. This is where you start. This is where you start in your walk with the Lord. This is where you start in order to be saved. And from there, you are expected to learn more about Torah and then obviously to put it into practice, to obey the mitzvot, to fulfill the mitzvot, as they say in the Jewish world. As a little side note here, you know, there are a lot of Christians today that say, oh, we don't need to obey any of the, any of the law anymore because Jesus fulfilled the law. Again, you're, you're talking from a Gentile point of view. You go and ask any Orthodox Jewish man on the street, hey, do you fulfill the mitzvot? Do you fulfill the commandments? Do you fulfill the law? They're all going to say, yes, I fulfill it. Yes, of course I fulfill the mitzvot. Of course I fulfill the law. Fulfill means to obey. Jesus, when he said, I'm, I've come to fulfill it, not to destroy it, not to abolish it, not to change it, I've come to fulfill it, which means I come to obey it. And if you follow Jesus, if you follow his example, you should be obeying it too. I can just hear the modern day corrupt Christian minds frying right now. I mean, a lot of people just don't understand this, but this is the truth. So let's go to verse 22 here. Verse 22 then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men out of their company and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas, called Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brothers. They wrote these things by their hand. So notice the apostles are like, well, hey, you know what? Paul and Barnabas here, they need help. They need to have some other representatives coming from the top. Notice I make a distinction between Paul and the top, okay? Coming from the top, we need to send out people with Paul and Barnabas to represent us so that they could also confirm and testify that this is what is required of the Gentiles. And they even put it in writing. They wrote a letter. So again, verse 23 here, they wrote these things by their hand. Quote, the apostles the elders, and the brothers, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Because we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no commandment, it seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose out men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas, that's Yehuda, Judah, and Silas, who themselves will also tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these necessary things, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality, from which, if you keep yourselves, it will be well with you. Farewell. Short letter, to the point, this is what is required of you. Can you imagine if these evangelists did that today? Everybody who comes forward and accepts the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Here, Here's the laws you're supposed to fulfill. Here's the laws you're supposed to obey. Here we go. I'll send you out a quick little short little letter. This is what you're supposed to do. This is what's required of you. Verse 30. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. Having gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over the encouragement. They rejoiced over the encouragement of having laws to obey in order to be saved. So, I mean, today just goes to show you how corrupt Christianity has become today. I mean, if you were to write 
down, you know, these are the laws of Moses that you're supposed to obey. And again, in context, this is the unspoken thing. We know that if anything we've established in our Bible reading, we've established that a lot of details is not written down, okay? We've established that over and over and over again. One of these details is that these laws, being the ancient form of the Noahide laws, are just the beginning of your walk with God. That is just the baby steps to get in the door, just to get in the door. Just entry-level Judaism, okay? Know this, know this of a certainty. In the first century, when the church was white hot, in the book of Acts, there was no distinction between Christians and Jews. There was no distinction between Christianity and Judaism. In fact, in context, Christianity was proclaimed to be the true Judaism. And that's why they went by so many of the different Judaistic precepts and commands. These people rejoiced over the encouragement. Today, the Christians would be going, oh no, we're not supposed to do that. That's, you got to put us, you want to put us back in bondage? And put us back in bondage? Stark contrast to real, true first century Christianity, where they looked at the commands as encouragement. Also know this. Psalm 119 is very clear. The Torah is not a burden. It is a blessing. It is the law of liberty, the law of freedom, the law of freedom from sin, the law of freedom from self. Verse 32, Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged the brothers with many words and strengthened them. After they had spent some time there, they were dismissed in peace from the brothers to the apostles. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Now, if you've enjoyed this teaching, hang on, because Acts chapter 21 is like the sequel to this. This is going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to Acts chapter 21. In fact, I'm looking forward to the last part of this chapter as well because I'm going to do that in the next teaching and every other passage as well. And as always, seek God with all your heart, all your heart. And if you do, you will find him and call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.